Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about the role of sociological theory, uh, specifically in qualitative research. Uh, and uh, like Sonia said, my research focuses on European settings, so not so much on, not on African settings, but I think that what I'm going to be discussing today will also inform the African settings, because I will be talking more about how theory informs the whole research process from uh, methods uh, to uh, how one sees the da da data and the analysis and, and, and then the conclusion. So in today's presentation, I'm going to take a talk about, give a short overview about the role of theory in the research process. And so I don't talk uh, in abstract forms. I'm going to give you examples from my own research, which is about racism in healthcare, uh, in order to uh, explain and showcase what I'm trying to talk about when it comes to the role of theory in research. So shortly about the role of theory in qualitative research. Um, very simply put, it's a very simplistic way of looking at it, but a very simply put theory is an attempt for us to understand a given phenomena, in my case, a given sociological phenomena. And so the primary applications of theory in qualitative research is to inform uh, the research paradigm and method. Uh, you could also theorize it. You could engage in theory building as a result of data collection. And I'm not going to talk about that in this presentation. The next presenter will discuss that more. And so theory is a whole framework that guides the process from, from, the, from the recruitment to writing the article, to publication, but it could also guide the specific article. Uh, so like I said, I will uh, talk about that by giving examples from my research so it becomes more clear. So theory and qualitative research is important because it informs the methodological approaches. So what kind of method are you going to use? Will you have a phenomenological approach? Are you going to conduct an ethnographic study? Are you going to do interviews, semi-structured interviews? Are you going to do focus group discussions? All of those decisions uh, are informed by theory. But it is also informed the different departure points or the different epistemological paradigms that one uses. Uh, so from the beginning, how do you see the phenomena that you're studying? Is it from a social constructionist? And I'm going to explain all of that view. Is it from a more critical view? Is it from a more materialist view? So uh, all of those things, uh, it's important to be um, informed by theory. So if I give you examples from my own research. Uh, like I said, I am looking at racism in healthcare and uh, I am looking specifically at how racism works within healthcare. So I'm not looking at racial inequalities or ethnic inequalities, but racism within the healthcare institution. Uh, and I'm doing that through, uh, because I've interviewed healthcare staff from different professions and backgrounds in Sweden. So, theory from the beginning was important for me to inform my methodology. So what is the question I am posing? And how does that question theoretically inform my methodology? My research is about understanding how racism works in healthcare. And to understand how racism works in healthcare, I am studying how healthcare staff reason or talk about racism in healthcare. And that's the first choice that I made. Why did I focus on talk in understanding the sociological phenomena? Is because I think talk is important in, uh, in understanding sociological phenomena because people express their positions about a certain phenomenon, in this case, racism, through talk. So then conceptually, the focus ought to be on how racism is produced in healthcare interactions. So talk, whether it is public talk, private talk, or through interviews, which I've done, 
fundamentally reflects the reality of racism and how racism is produced and made sense of. So what I want you to take from this is that why I've chosen to interview healthcare staff um, is informed by theory. And, and in this case, the theory that talk it represents and reflects reality. So because I understand talk as reflecting of reality, I have chosen to interview healthcare staff in order to understand their ideas about racism and because understanding their ideas about racism will help me inform how racism works in healthcare. So this is an example of how theory is then used to inform the methodology. Theory also informs the, what departure point uh, one has in, in regards to the phenomena that one is uh, studying. In my case, it's race and racism. So how do I look at the sociological phenomena? How do I look at race and racism? Is it from a constructionist view? Uh, yes, because I have to decide how I look at race. Race is a political and social construct, so it's not real. It is something that is made up but it's produced through racism. So I have a social constructivist departure point. That is a theoretical uh, choice that I've made based on my uh, understanding of race. But then even though race is a political and social construct, it has real materialist consequences on people's lives because it informs their access to public goods and it has also effects on people's health, both mental and physical, independent of other variables. So then I am using a, a social constructionist, that is that race is something that is made up and produced by racism, but also a materialist departure point because race uh, and therefore uh, racism and, and therefore race actually has real material content consequences on people and, and one can look at it differently. So you have uh, some social scientists who say that one can use the word race uh, because it has materialist um, consequences and then you have other social scientists who say we should not use the word race but use the word racialization because it alludes to the process. Uh, so we don't use produce racism through uh, using the word race. So what I'm trying to say here is that the choice of concepts and terms that you're going to use in your research should also be informed by theory. So should I use the term race or racialization is a decision that I have to make. And that decision is based on theory. So if I'm just going to use the term racialization, then I need to justify it through theory as well. So all the concepts, it's very important that one defines the concept that one uses, it does not only apply to studies uh, of racism. If one is studying culturally sensitive care, then one has to define culture and one has to decide early on what the theoretical departure point one has in regards to culture and then define culture in order then to be able to write the article or analyze the research. The concept needs to be defined and grounded within theory. Things like if um, uh, I, in my research, for instance, I am going to look at different groups that are, uh, uh, the group that is subjected to racism. How do I describe that group uh, that is subjected to racism? And do I use the term ethnic minority? Do I use the term racialized minorities? Do I use the term, ra the term racialized and minoritized group? Is the dominant group also racialized? So all of those questions are questions that I had to, wrestle with for a very long time, but in the end, one has to choose a departure point and then explain it. Why do I use the term racialized? Why do I, if I use the term minority, what does the term minority mean? Is the term minority only alluding to number of people or is it also um, dealing with power relations? So, so what I'm trying to explain here is that theory will uh, inform the choice of method that you make from the beginning. It will, depending on what departure points you have, will inform which concepts you use, how you use the concepts, and how you define the concepts in terms that you would use when you're describing a specific phenomena in healthcare or elsewhere. Um, also, uh, the use of theory is informed by the literature review that one hopefully conducts before starting to write an article or a research project or conducting a research project. So uh, I did a scoping review that looked at all the articles that have looked at racism in healthcare in all different contexts. Uh, and you can see here that this is a, something uh, 
that is relatively new, but that it has increased substantially from 2017, probably because of the Black Lives Matter movement and COVID-19. But what I found in this research that the racial categories that are, are used are static, and used uncritically, and that the research is mostly de descriptive. So the research only tells me that racism exists in healthcare, that's it. But it does not theoretically showcase how racism actually works in healthcare. Because it is descriptive and because it is a theoretical, uh, and mostly uh, most of that research does not use theory to explain experiences of racism in healthcare, it does not show me how racism actually works in healthcare. And I argue that it's important to understand how a, a phenomenon works so that I can do something about it. So then my departure point also is informed by the review that I did where the theoretical departure point that I'm making is that the meanings of race and racism or racialization need to be located within particular fields of discourse and articulated to the social relations found within that context. So simply put, in order to understand racism in healthcare and how racism works, one has to understand how race is made sense of and racism hence made sense of within healthcare settings, right? And the only way to do that and move beyond this very descriptive type of research is through theory. So theory will explain how the sociological phenomena looks like in a given context, in this case in healthcare. So then theory informs the contextual understanding of research, right? And uh, in my case, uh, after I've decided how I view race and racism based on the different sociological uh, theoretical contributions that have been made, then I also have to understand the contextual understanding of my research. So my research is situated in Western Europe. Your research would be situated in, uh, in, in, in different African contexts. But the context is also important in the historical context in understanding the sociological phenomena that you are studying. So in Western Europe, for instance, we do not have racial categories. They're illegal except for the United Kingdom. So we, it's illegal to collect, to have racial categories. Uh, so that is something that informs the research. And therefore racism, racism is mostly subtle or implicit. So uh, research around racism talks a lot about implicit racial bias that healthcare staff have implicit bias towards uh, racialized minorities. So then how do I understand that which is subtle? How do I understand that which is made invisible? How would I make it visible? And that could only be done through sociological theory. And I guess that is why the research has been mostly descriptive because it has not engaged in theory. And also how does racialization happens in the different contexts? This is also something where I have to use theory and historical understanding how different racial categories have been constructed in Sweden. So it informed my method, it informed how I view the sociological phenomena, in this case racism that I'm studying, it informed the concepts that I've used and why I've used those certain concepts and how I define them, but it also informed my contextual understanding of the whole research and the different processes that I am studying in that given context. So all of those things were in, situated in, in theory. Um, and and, and uh, for instance, I uh, there's a lot here, I just wanna say that um, not going into the types of racism that occur is that there, um, there's a lot of research conducted in medical sociology that does not inform public health because the disciplines don't speak to each other and that's really a pity. So you have a lot of research in medical sociology, you have a lo lot of sociological research that public health uh, academics are, um, the, the disciplines don't speak to each other, so they are not using the sociological theory. So I think that's one of the problems when it comes to public health or healthcare, that you see other disciplines like education, for instance, uh, when it comes to studies of racism, they, they are much more advanced than, study, than studies of racism in healthcare. And that's because they are more closely related, I think, to the social science. So they use all those different theories that already exist. So that is something that we need to get better at in public health, is views of theory. Especially now after the COVID-19 and all of those complex issues that we're facing, I don't think that they can be addressed or 
uh, explained without uh, in, immersing ourselves in theory. Uh, one of the things that one can use uh, when, it, when it comes to theory is this medical knowledge. And this is something that I've, uh, I've used in my research. Medical knowledge is often seen as evidence-based medicine which is uh, based on rationality and neutrality and objectivity. And that's been given us enormous benefits in effectiveness of treatments and systemizes evidence on which diagnosis and treatment plans are based. But there is this notion uh, in healthcare that um, evidence-based medicine, rationality, neutrality, and objectivity should also eradicate illegitimate discrimination in theory. But we know from sociological research that there are other forms of knowledge and practice like bedside manner or clinical intuition or what we call narrative-based medicine that also informs diagnosis and treatment that is not necessarily evidence-based. So understanding that kind of sociological contribution will also make us understand and criticize evidence-based medicine as the only form of knowledge in, in, in healthcare and makes us also understand the different discriminatory practices that may happen in healthcare, in my case, racism. So in my data, uh, we had, uh, when I interviewed healthcare staff, they did acknowledge that racism exists in healthcare, and they gave me a lot of stories about how that happens. But it was always somewhere else, in another unit, in another hospital, in another group of healthcare staff. So there were different ways of denying racism. So they would say, I treat every patient as an individual or only clinical criteria are taken into consideration. Or in this department, we're very good at ethics and everyone is really nice, though, so, though there's no racism. So there exists a denial of, the, uh, of, of racism in healthcare, but we do have evidence of inequality that persists. So there's a paradox between seeing healthcare as neutral and objective and rational about how healthcare staff see themselves as good at ethics and they only take clinical criteria into consideration and between the evidence of inequality and racism in healthcare that we see. So that paradox, we need to move beyond just describing it by theorizing, by looking at theory. Uh, theory can also, in my case, have been helpful in understanding the subtleness of racism because racism is mostly subtle. It's not very common that a healthcare staff will say, I'm not treating you because you're an ethnic minority or because you're black or because you're Muslim or a migrant. What happens as this Swedish midwife of minority background told us it is not upfront, so it's behind the curtains uh, and that her colleagues would talk about People of non-European background ask, oh, they have so many visitors, how uh, they anticipate that immigrants will have more visitors and it's thought to be awkward when there are many visiting. And, and, and yes, they say that's their culture. It's all about them and us making the distinction between patient groups. So this healthcare staff is talking about the other ring that happens when different groups of patients are racialized. And another um, physician here is uh, uh, who belongs to the majority group talks about how they sometimes use terms like cultural pain. There are such things as cultural pain, but ethnic pain, maybe you call it. So you have prejudices against certain groups and it's so it's often those people coming from the Middle East that you talk about negatively as if they have some kind of ethnic pain. They just exaggerate and they like it's a huge work. So the data shows that there are racialization processes that happen where certain groups of people, mostly non-European people from the Middle East or African origin are seen as having a different perception of pain and exaggerating their pain and therefore not treated equally. So the, the challenge uh, is to use and understand those racialization processes in order to understand how deprioritization happens in healthcare. So here is just one case from, from my data where this patient that I call Usama, this was a story that was told to us by uh, two medical students. Usama had a broken elbow that has not healed correctly, that has affected his arm's mobility. His family doctor refers him to an orthopod, Yuhan we call him. Yuhan reads the notes and just by looking at the name says, oh, we'll never solve this problem to the medical students. Those people are hard to work. They always exaggerate their symptoms. Their family's always around and it's so noisy. And at the end of the consultation, Johan decides that, okay, we should not operate on your arm. It could make matters worse and the mobility is not so bad. 
So here is a suspicion that is based on supposition that is racialization of this Kusama person that uh, Yuhan has uh, viewed as having this ethnic pain leads to deprioritization of care. But this is not something that would be visible to Usama, right? Uh, there's this case, for instance, uh, of a family, a, a black family who rings to an ambulance for a patient who's not responsive, the patient is unconscious, the ambulance arrives but declines the case and calls it in the file a case of cultural fainting, so that the patient is faking their uh, fainting. Uh, and so the family has to drive the patient to the hospital. But care is deprioritized in the hospital because the arrival is, has not happened to be an ambulance. Two years later, uh, after, because the care was not prioritized, the patient actually had complete paralysis. It turned out that the patient had cerebral hemorrhage that was not diagnosed. Two years later, the patient dies because of, of, of complications uh, uh, due to not being prioritized. So here you have a deprioritization that's amplified by organizational deprioritization. So what do I want to say by uh, giving you all of those examples is that just looking at this phenomena and describing it does not explain how racism works in healthcare. The th we need theory to understand how culturalized notions of race are invoked as opposed to biological or scientific notions of race. We need to understand how contemporary manifestations of racism could be encoded in a discourse that evades accusations of racism. And also how racism may be expressed through coded signifiers that are hidden behind a seemingly race neutral discourse. In the case of Osama with the broken elbow, Yuhan was able to say, I'm not going to treat you because your elbow is fine, your arm is fine, the mobility uh, is, is okay. But without Osama knowing that there has been a reaction to his name that they are exaggerating their symptoms and so on. And I have other examples as well, but that's just one example that I gave you. So then the theory here is important to understand how discrimination works in healthcare, any kind of discrimination, in my case, racism. So we have legitimate discrimination in healthcare where we do have to prioritize patients. We cannot treat all the patient at the same time. So one has to decide if this patient needs to receive care first or that patient needs to receive care first. But it is when illegitimate discrimination interleaves with racialization processes, with rationing of organization of resources, and with the different organizational imperatives, like if you don't arrive with an ambulance, then you're deprioritized, and so on, uh, that healthcare staff can hide behind those organizational imperatives and also not really say things like black people exaggerate their pain but use different culturalized notions of race like ethnic pain and so on in order to then discriminate and deprioritize subtly so um i hope that i uh, not getting so much into discussion about racism was able to explain how Theoretical understanding of race and racism has informed my methodology, the use of my concepts, their definitions, and also the analysis process where you, theory gives you um, and um, makes you, it, it, it makes you able to, uh, uh, to understand in depth the sociological phenomenon and how it works rather than just offering a very descriptive one, two, three, four and uh, explanation of the phenomena. And that's what I have. We, we, we've just received a very fantastic um, uh, over the first part of the presentation, which um, uh, and, and the use of theory uh, that we are in, in qualitative research. And I'm going to be looking at the second part. Um, she's brilliantly indicated how um, theory informs the research, the qualitative research informs the selection of her participants, informs the um, informs how she also conceptualized her study but on this other side what i'm going to be doing um, is looking at how the data or qualitative data now informs theory so it's the other way of the coin rather than theory informing the data collection and the selection of participants and how the phenomenon is being studied this time around we are going to be looking at how our methodology and data collection and the data that we have received informs now um, the development of theory. So I'm looking at theory development 
um, and these are um, um, using qualitative methods. So um, I think that we all know that one of the qualitative approaches that has really owned um, the development of theory within their um, paradigm is grounded theory. And the name itself suggests that direction. So in grounded theory, um, we all know that um, the researcher goes to the field with tries to blot out any preconceived um, um, theories that are existing, tries to not to do a literature review as it's usually advised in grounded theory, so as not to have preconceived notion about the phenomenon that is being studied, so that whatever comes out is a theory that emanates based on the data that the researcher found in the field. And so, and so when you move, when they move now, when, when, um, when the researcher moves to the field, they just want to build a theory, as the name suggests, based on what they found in the field. They don't want any pre-existing theory to inform whatever they're doing. When it comes, therefore, to theory development, especially in qualitative research, we are looking at the level of theory, which is called the mid-range theory. We're not looking at grand theories like um, the theories of gravity, um, but a middle-range theory. And Merton in 1949 described um, a middle-range theory as involving some level of abstraction, but the theory still remains very close to the data that was obtained. But then at the same time, that theory that is obtained is abstracted enough to be able to explain a phenomenon that can capture the reality of a particular group of people experiencing a particular phenomenon, maybe in a particular context. So it's not going to be your grand physics theory of pulls and pushes and, um, and the laws of movement, but it's, at, um, it's a sociological level of theory that will allow you to explain different phenomena, different phenomena about a group of people and it involves some level of abstraction, moving um, away from your data, but then the theory is grounded in the data that was obtained. And so to do this grounded, um, um, the, um, grounded theorists, they um, try to use three principal approaches, which towards um, uh, developing their theory. And the first is during their coding process. So everything, because their focus is about developing a theory, everything that they do is kind of conscientious so that a theory, so that the aim of developing a theory is fulfilled. So the way the data is coded. So in the coding of the data, it is done in such a way that the researcher starts looking at different constructs that are emanating from the data. And the whole point is to link these constructs to explain a particular phenomenon. So the coding is very important because this is when the different um, 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 concepts are extracted from the data. And then the researcher now moves on to conceptualize this um, uh, um, and the different con concepts that emanate from the coding process. And then what is very useful to the, um, to, to the researcher is the memoing process. The moment where you start thinking about how do these constructs link to each other? How do the different concepts that are emanating from my coding process, how do they speak to each other? How are, in what ways are they connected? And so being um, using that approach now, the, the researcher now, is now moving towards a step towards developing theory, linking and drafting theoretical analysis and linking how these constructs speak to each other. And at the third most important aspect that um, uh, grounded theorists use is the theoretical sampling, where they are selecting their different participants based on on the information that they can offer, but particularly that that information helps them to continue to either test the developing theory or to continue to build more upon the theory that they are constructing. So they will be sampling people that will have the requisite information to help them understand their theory better or to help them to understand how the different constructs or the different concepts that came from the coding process 
is linked together to be able to provide some level of explanation of their phenomenon. So therefore the process here is very, very, is, is very, very meaningful towards developing a theory. And then since um, grounded theory is more or less often older, um, uh, um, older the paradigm of developing theory, but now more and more we are seeing people doing research in the realist um, uh, um, paradigm where we have more, first your positivist um, uh, um, paradigm, we have your constructivist paradigm and then realist paradigm is sitting somewhere in the middle where it is accepting some some precepts or some concepts from the positivist and also accepting some concepts from the constructivist to form its own paradigm. And so we now saw with a lot of people um, being conscientious about, um, uh, about, about grounded theory and about theory development, a lot of people now started saying that let's see how the critical realist paradigm can even help us in our in, in explaining things better, in coming up with what I'll put quote unquote better theories. And when, we, when I say better theories is about now linking or coming up with causation, trying to say that this causes this, or it is because of the existence of this that the other one exists. And without this, that cannot exist. And so we now move to a level of um, um, theorizing where people want to make certain that their theories are more evidence-based and more tighter. And so we have a lot of people now borrowing notions from critical realism and to enhance their grounded theory. And I think that early and um, right um, already in the years 2011, people started thinking about mixing these two paradigms. We have another, um, another author who, who, who tried to enhance um, uh, groundedness in realist grounded in theory. So we now see more um, ideas about theorizing in qualitative research coming up, not using theories to inform um, the phenomenon but um, or how the research is conducted, but let the research itself, let the end product of the research be a theory. And so that is how more and more people are now mixing critical realism and grounded theory. So while the other two were using um, um, critical realism to enhance their grounded theory, the, the last author used grounded theory approaches to also embed it within their critical realist understanding. And now this will lead me now to move into critical realism where it is more about theory development. And so critical realism or realist research, as we call it in general, is the paradigm that says that we need to see how things occur to be able to understand them. And when they, we talk about seeing how things occur, it's not about describing them. It's not only expl about exploring them and describing what happened. But now we need to move away from what happened to exactly how it happens and why it happens. So critical realist research or realist research in general is about coming up with these explanations and these deep level seated explanations. And so they came up with the term mechanism to now indicate that they are looking for underlining entities. They are looking for these processes that makes things to happen. They're looking for what are the underlying processes or entities or structures that are existing that will make people to behave in a particular way. So now they're actually moving and saying, for example, in, in um, let me use the Sarah's example, um, perceived racism will cause somebody to behave in a certain way. For example, um, uh, I'll use my example in terms of um, medication. A lot of people who are on antiretroviral treatment, they tend to not take their treatment when they are around their friends because they don't want their friends to know that they are um, living with HIV. And so they are seeing themselves now because they are um, scared, if I might say, of being stigmatized, then they will not take their medication. So in that case, we will explain that perceived stigma is now 
a mechanism to explain uh, medication non-adherence. And so that now becomes a theory where rather than having a theory explaining the phenomenon, we are now, um, 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 we are now actually using a theory, rather, rather than having a theory explaining how our research was conducted, we are actually having, based on our data collected, a theory now emanating from it because you spoke to these people and they told you about um, uh, about stigma, they told you about discrimination, and they told you how it impacted on their behavior and what they will do to not take their medication because of the um, because of the context within which they find themselves. And so we're now looking at rather how then the data that has been collected now can be used to build theories to explain some observations that we have made. And so a mechanism is also defined as the reasoning or the responses how people think about a particular thing, how people perceive actions, how people perceive an intervention. You can, if, if you come and counsel me, you can provide counseling and your hope of counseling is that I'm going to stop smoking. Now, for me to stop smoking depends on how I perceived your counseling. If the information you provided to me was convincing enough, then that might cause me to stop smoking. But if it wasn't convincing enough, so based on the reasoning that I apply or that your, um, uh, that your intervention offered to me, I can change my behavior in a particular direction or not. So that leads us now to move now onto how then theorizing occurs in realist research. So realist research is really explanatory in nature. And that's why I said that the focus of realist research is on the how, and the why things happen, not really on the what. So they are using the how and the why to explain the what happened. So then what we are looking for are structures. We are looking for the influence of structures. We are looking for mechanisms, like I said, this underlining, um, uh, underlining explanations, underlining entities that explain how things work to explain the outcome, which I now say it's what has been observed, the what. And so, um, we have what we call heuristic tools, tools or that we use to build our our, um, our 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 theories. And this little diagram that I have here is just um, a causal diagram or a causal heuristic tool to explain how realist um, uh, theories are being constructed. So you have your structure with causal powers. These structures, for example, can be laws. They can be policies because these policies will affect how somebody is going to do something. If there are policies that I cannot go into my neighbor's house and steal his things and that stealing is a crime, then that policy is there. It will def definitely affect my behavior. So that's why we say with causal powers because it has the power to make me behave in a particular way. And then we have other um, conditions with other mechanisms for, um, with, other, with, with other mechanisms. For example, I might be in a situation of extreme poverty. And even though there are laws like in the structure saying I cannot go to my neighbor's house and steal, but because of my condition that I've not eaten all morning, it might still cause me to go into my neighbor's house and go and steal whatever I can find to go and sell and eat. And then um, all those fit now into what we call mechanism. What exactly caused me to go and do what I did? And the effect is stealing, for example, that I'm giving. So that mechanism, therefore, is probably because my perceived, I'm perceiving that if I do not eat, I am going to die. So perceived self-preservation therefore is a mechanism in this case, because if I don't eat, I'm going to die. So self-preservation therefore becomes the mechanism that caused me to go and steal. So um, moving on, um, this is now just an example of a study that I conducted um, using qualitative methods to theorize. And um, it's a, it, this is a methodological paper and I was arguing on how we can leverage photo voice methodology. I'm sure all of us here we um, we have um, we have we have some ideas about photo voice methodology, and it is a qualitative research method. So in this paper, I had noticed that 
most of the time we are having interviews and focus group discussions and observations as qualitative methods that were often used for theorizing but photo voice methodology was missing in the literature. And so I conducted a study on um, and based on photo voice methodology, and I used that towards the, um, 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 developing some level of middle range theory in, in the healthcare. So my focus was on antiretroviral medication adherence or non-adherence amongst adolescents. Basically, what I'm saying is that I was trying to explain why adolescents who are living with HIV, they adhere to their medication or they do not adhere to their medication. So it is very, very theoretical in nature. And that is the direction that I took. And again, using, I'm just going, this is the research cycle that I obtained. So first and foremost, I developed a tentative theory. So in my tentative theory, I just went to, um, the, the, I just went to the literature and I asked myself, what are the factors that are frequently reported as affecting adherence to medication? And so you would have your normal descriptive studies and exploratory studies um, amongst adolescents that will give you the um, existing factors. So I now use these existing factors now to put together now a possible theory of what I think personally, based on the literature, why adolescents adhere to their medication or not. And then I came to the, to the adolescents now who were my study participants, and I explained to them that what I need for you people to do is to go and take photos of different elements in your house or around you or wherever that represents how you feel about antiretroviral treatment. I told them, take pictures of the things that will represent what makes you happy about taking your medication, um, things that will facilitate you taking your medication and also take um, pictures of things that make you not want to take your medication or fail to take your medication or skip your treatment. And so we sent them home for a week and then we gave them cell phones, smart cell phones, and then they got back to us um, a week later and then they shared their pictures with us and then we projected the pictures and then we will ask them to explain what we see in the pictures in relation to their medication adherence behavior. And so this is, and my, I decided to represent my theory in a diagrammatic way. And I often do that because to me, it is clearer in its explanation. And I and, and in my introduction, you also, it was also reported that I, I like seeing complexity. I'm, I'm a co complexity researcher. So I like to represent my complexity um, diagrammatically for whosoever is interested to be able to see that this thing is not a one angle thing, but it has several different perspectives, which, um, which we can look at. I'm just going to take an arm, for example. Um, this is now the theory that explains why or how um, at, um, adolescents, they adhere to their medication. For example, we say family and other social um, structures. So if you have family, you have other social structures, you have people supporting you who are there, they provide the finances, they are there to help you. That one, I describe that as the structure that is existing. But then the important contextual element is that because most adolescents are living with HIV because they got it from their parents through, um, 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 through um, childbirth. And so Important contextual elements I found that came up was that if the parent has disclosed their own stages to, to their child and have explained to the child how they came about to be HIV positive, if the child has disclosed to their friends and other family members and the physical and emotional support they receive, then what will happen is that these adolescents will perceive that they are being supported and the perception of being supported makes one to easily adhere to medication because you would have people who would help you to go to the clinic, remind you to take your medication, remind you of your, of your appointments. And so that now um, it, at, at, it, it's, a, it's a micro theory that I've developed at that end. But putting the entire picture together gives me what I've described as a middle range theory because there are other elements that we can see to it. And then now these are now, this is also now a middle range theory to explain how medication um, medication non-adherence possibly happens. And again, I'm going to use the family and other social support structures. 
then the context in this situation is refusal of family support, where the family does not really offer you that support, where you don't have somebody to remind you to take your medication. You, don't, you have family um, um, uh, disaccord um, and relationships are not so good. And then you also have to um, reliance on peers for support, but then you don't really get them and your peers to support you because they are far away. And so this will um, cause negative peer pressure on this person. And there is there is the likelihood that they will not adhere to their medication because all their friends will, will, will be doing is call them for partying, for other things that might go against um, their, their treatment. And so they will feel a negative peer pressure and that will probably lead to non-adherence. Usually we don't encourage them to take alcohol, but if you are having friends who are always drinking and you are HIV positive and you have not disclosed to them, they are likely to lead you to that direction. And so that is also another mini theory that is developed within the entire theory. And so once people started realizing how critical realism is actually offering a very strong theoretical um, foundation or offering a very good tool for qualitative researchers to um, build their research or start building solid theories in, 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 in qualitative research. We now start seeing authors like, um, like Bogna who are now using critical realism and constructivism. They are trying to merge these two paradigms to come up with a deeper qualitative study or qualitative um, explanation. And here I've highlighted what they said their, their critical realist um, part helped them to do. They are suggesting here that that um, where I've highlighted that critical realism offered a complementary but essential framework to explore causal mechanisms, which I've, which I've indicated, and that led to deeper understanding of the findings by searching for the processes and causality that lay beneath the social and organizational phenomena. Thank you very much for listening. My time is up.